For those of you who have been waiting to see it, here is part two of the Packard Bell 386 computer story. Will it have a happy ending or not? I don't know. But for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, let's go ahead and recap here. I found this system out in my storage shed after having collected it from the local public library when they upgraded and shuffled around their computers. This system worked and received occasional use when it was put into storage. When I pulled it out of storage a day or two ago, it wasn't working. It had no sign of life when it powered up, and then the power supply failed. Well, I've gone through it more since then because at first I thought the motherboard was simply dead, that something bad had happened to the motherboard maybe when the power supply went, because the first time it powered up, it powered up normally. The second time it powered up, the power supply was audibly whining because something was dragging down the switching transistor and reducing its switching frequency into the audible range, or the power supply was shorted and hitting its current limit, while the regulator circuitry was still trying to keep it in regulation and functioning. Whatever may have happened with the power supply, I feared the worst for the motherboard until the very end of part one of the video about this computer when all of a sudden the motherboard issued two rather sickly sounding beeps from the little squeaker can speaker that you just saw there. And I thought, you know, that doesn't sound like a Phoenix BIOS error code. Something that all of you should know about Phoenix BIOS error codes, if they don't appear on the screen or if the BIOS cannot initialize the video hardware to its satisfaction, there will be multiple beeps issued and they are issued in a series that composes the entire code. For example, a code might be one beep, a pause, two beeps, a pause, and three beeps. When run through a decoder or compared to a list of beep codes that you might find online or in printed form, you can figure out what the system is being bothered about. Some of the codes are terminal because, especially on a motherboard like this, where a lot of things are permanently soldered and most people aren't going to have the means by which to repair them. Other things, like defective video, may be worked around if the circumstances are correct. And that brings to light a problem with these boards that have everything integrated into them. As you can see, this system has its serial port, its parallel port, even a game port, and video hardware on board. A lot of times, manufacturers assumed that you wouldn't necessarily want to disable these things or ever have a need to disable them, especially on budget systems such as this one. Fortunately, Packard Bell was thinking, because there are jumpers to enable and disable just about everything on this board, from the most basic things like the serial and parallel port, all the way up to stuff like the hard and floppy drive controllers that are built in. So if a piece of hardware is defective, it can be disabled. Well, I took this board out of the system and I gave it a good hand washing just to clean it up because it was so filthy. And I wondered if maybe some of that filth wasn't slightly conductive and causing problems. What I found when I got all the filth cleaned off the board, you can see the video memory chips right here. And up to about this fourth chip or so, there is corrosion on the legs of these chips. And I really think that that's keeping the video hardware in this system from coming up. I'm not sure what caused the corrosion. A likely cause is usually the clock battery, but in this case, I can't find any evidence that the clock battery had ever leaked, and if it had leaked, I would have expected it to destroy many other things in its path, like the 8042 keyboard and mouse port controller, or this Motorola Timekeeper I see over here, or even this little National Semiconductor Logic chip. None of those things have been hurt, so I'm not sure what happened. I do know that when I took the motherboard out, I found a whole cluster of dead ants concentrated in this area. So clearly, my shed contains bugs, and that's going to have to be dealt with. Maybe I need to use a bug bomb, or even a real bomb. But in light of the system unit producing these beeps, I knew that it couldn't be completely dead. And so, based on the suggestion of a couple of YouTubers, as well as my own prior experience, because I do have a decent amount of experience with these older computers. I grew up when these things were popular, and my dad actually owned a machine identical to this one back in the day when it would have been new. So I looked into my collection of ISA video cards, and I found one right here that should be suitable for testing. I went ahead and changed the VGA jumper to disabled here, and I'm going to install this video card in a moment and see if this system can actually go ahead and come fully to life. Well, on the subject of video cards, it's very definitely worth noting that the budding antique computer enthusiast 
is probably going to find themselves in a very expensive situation if they have to buy one of these. So if by some chance you find an ISA video card or VGA card in particular like this one floating around, go ahead and grab it if the price is at all reasonable or really reasonable as in free. Because I went out to eBay looking at these just to see what the market was like. I was convinced they couldn't be that expensive because at one point in time, there was a huge glut of these things on the market. Most of them tried in 8900 powered cards. Boy, did I get a shock. The video card market for ISA video cards is apparently not in that great of a supply anymore, and what is out there seems to be very expensive. So I'm guessing that either after many years, the supply has simply dried up, or these sellers feel that they can get the money for their particular video card. I did find one cheap video card that I went ahead and plucked just to have it in my collection, although it was advertised as not necessarily working. The next cheapest option I found was $20, so again I say if you have a cache of these cards, you definitely want to sit on them. Going back to the motherboard for a moment, fellow YouTuber Jerkwad152 actually pointed out that there were dots on this motherboard that looked like they might be places to accommodate a SIP. A SIP is basically a 30 pin SIM with pins on it instead of edge card connectors. SIPs were not that long lived in the computer industry, but you will sometimes find them in systems around the 286 to 386 SX era. And it looks like Packard Bell's designers thought about doing a couple of different things with this computer's memory hardware. Around these soldered memory chips right here, these are the working memory and these smaller chips over here are actually the parity bits because this system would have required parity memory. You can see that there are outlines, silk screens in the PCB artwork that look not unlike a SIM slot. And what's more, you can see they are actually designated as SIM 1, SIM 2, and SIM 3. So clearly Packard Bell's designers thought about making this board able to accommodate up to a total of eight SIM sockets or soldered memory chips in the first four, in the first two banks here and then the parity chips over here right next to the actual populated SIM slots. Whether or not they actually thought about putting SIPs in this system I don't know but as you can see looking at the silver dots next to the parity chips you can see that they either thought about putting a through hole SIM socket there or installing a SIP socket there. One of the two is certainly a possibility. Pausing to talk about the video card for a moment, you can see that there are a lot of discrete components on this card which dates from the late 1980s and is an early Super VGA card based on a Western Digital chipset. Yes, that is the same Western Digital that makes hard drives. They branched out into video for a while and eventually sold their video division off into a separate company known as Paradise. Paradise eventually folded. Let's take a look at some of the components on this card. The first two chips right here are the video BIOS, which contains the software routines needed to tell the computer that this is a video card and tell it how to use it. These chips also contain the software needed to enable and configure the various display modes. Above those chips is a RAM DAC, or Random Access Memory Digital to Analog Converter. This takes the digital data out of the video memory chips and converts it into an analog form of varying voltages that can then be interpreted and displayed by your VGA monitor. VGA was actually something of a, of a departure in this regard because earlier systems did actually relay a digital signal to the monitor which was then decoded in the monitor's own electronic logic. Since this video card is capable of multiple modes, there's more video memory present than would have been standard on a VGA adapter of the time. These chips right here represent the base memory and are permanently installed. Then there are a series of video memory chips over here that have been installed for expansion purposes and would allow greater resolution and color depth to be accomplished by way of the video processor. There are also discrete timing sources for each of the major video modes supported by this thing. That's what these cans are. They are all individual clock crystals that are used to establish the base clocks for all of the major video modes supported by this adapter. These days pretty much everything except the video memory itself will be contained inside a modern video processor from the RAM DAC to the VGA BIOS and all the supporting logic. The multiple clock sources will also have been replaced with a flexible clock generator that works by multiplying or dividing a single clock frequency as needed 
to achieve the desired clock frequencies needed by the graphics processor. Now, I have no idea what will happen. There could still be a ton of potential problems with this system. The motherboard could still very well be dead. But here goes nothing. Using the 386DX40 computer's power supply as a surrogate to replace the fallen power supply from this machine. Here's the first power on with the new video card installed. Look at that. America grew up listening to us. It still does. Well, not anymore because when NEC, who ended up buying Packard Bell, took them out of this country, their products left the United States market. However, the Packard Bell name these days is controlled by Acer, the same as eMachines and Gateway, and Packard Bell still enjoys some success in the European market. The tagline that was printed above and that has now disappeared is actually a hint to Packard Bell's past as a radio and television manufacturer before someone bought the name from Teledyne Corporation and took Packard Bell into the computer manufacturing business. As you can see, there are definitely a pretty fair number of problems here. The two disk drives aren't hooked up, so their reporting has failed. And the configuration information is invalid because there is no longer a battery on the motherboard to keep it intact. But let's go ahead and go into the system program, the system setup program here. And have a look around and see what's going on with some of these various things. And you can see that there are some very interesting things in here. The configuration for diskette drives A and B is completely wrong. A would have been the three and a half inch drive and B would have been the five and a quarter, but it's got them reversed. What's also very interesting is this. Somehow or another it's ended up in the year 2000 and boy, is that year 2000 compliant or what? That's actually kind of surprising because this system ordinarily, its BIOS will not accept dates in the year 2000. In fact, if you try to set one, it will actually take the uh, system date back to 1990. So I'm not sure what's going on here. If the Century Byte in the Motorola Timekeeper IC has actually become set into the 2000s or what? But yeah, under ordinary circumstances, this thing will not accept dates past the year 1999, and any time it encounters one, the BIOS software will actually revert the date to January 1st, 1990. I can go ahead and try setting the date here. Let's see, it's March, what is it? I think it's, well, I'll go backwards, it's faster that way. I think it's the 29th, and it's not 2090, it's, uh, I wonder how far that goes, probably up to 2100. Oh, yep, 2099 to 1980. So if this thing still happened to be working in the year 2099, you would be out of luck because it would have wrapped around at that point. But let's go ahead and set it for the year 2012. I don't know what time it currently is. It's fairly late right now. And I'll go ahead and configure the diskette drives appropriately for what they ought to be. No hard drive presently installed. The memory should be automatically detected. Our video card is actually a VGA or EGA card. We have a keyboard. And over here are the performance improvement options. What these shadow options basically do is they take a copy of the ROM contents from both the system BIOS and the video BIOS and they copy them into random access memory. The reason this is done is speed because it's slow to actually go through a cycle and access the contents of either 8-bit wide ROM. So if they're copied into the much faster system RAM area, this speeds up execution of your programs. However, this also complicates memory management because some portion of the random access memory is used to hold these things, and if that portion of the memory is mistakenly allowed to be used by other programs, the best result will be a lockup, the worst result will be outright corruption of whatever it is you're working on, probably followed by a lockup. So let's go ahead and save the system options here. I'll go ahead and uh, install the floppy drives and come right back after this. Something just happened that is an example of the kind of fun that you can really get to having with old computers in unknown working conditions. I just went ahead and I hooked up both of the Packard Bell stock floppy drives that were in this system. And for a moment after I turned the power on, everything was fine, but then the power supply in the 386DX40 machine shifted its cooling fan into overdrive. And I'll tell you what, smoking components causes your heart to sink. 
something like a power supply fan suddenly hitting overdrive due to an unexpected increase in uh, current delivery needs and response of the thermal fan control mechanisms, which I'm a little surprised this power supply actually has, that'll get your heart racing. I went and hit the power switch pretty darn quickly, so clearly one of these drives has got a problem of some kind, probably a soft short, because a hard short should have tripped the crowbar protection circuitry. That does suggest that this power supply is actually pretty healthy, or at least it was. <laughs> and it may also suggest that the news is not quite as dire as I thought it would be for this old power supply, which may, since the floppy drives were hooked up to it, have been working completely normally, despite all these damaged capacitors that are present in here, especially that one, whoops, especially that one right there, which looks really, really attractive, doesn't it? Well, I've gone ahead and robbed a floppy drive out of the carcass of the Leading Edge 386 whose motherboard died due to battery failure and resultant leakage damaging many of the board traces. So let's go ahead and try powering up again here. I'll actually have to change some of the system options in setup because it's, unless it's lost its memory, which I don't think it will have that quickly, it will still think that it's got two floppy drives attached. So here's try number two. Hopefully, without any theatrics from the system's power supply. Well, everything still seems to be working fairly well. But I know it's not going to be happy when it finds that it doesn't have a second floppy drive. There's the drive seek. Yep, need to run the setup program. So let's see here, go back in here and change that to not installed. Everything else is still pretty much set the way it was. So let's go ahead and restart the system and somewhere around here, what happened to it? I've got a boot disk that I'm going to try, see if this system will actually go ahead and start. Oh, there it is, right up there. I'll go ahead and uh, put this in here, hopefully without shorting the drive to any part of the system frame, and we'll reboot, see if it'll actually start up. Four megabytes of extended memory. Anybody remember when that was a lot? I'm sure there's a fair number of people here that do. Looks like it's actually going to boot. And it did! I just went ahead and made a boot disk on a Windows XP machine, actually the Blog TV music player computer because it's across the room. And so that boot disk reports being a Windows Millennium boot disk. However, the command interpreter from Windows 95 and greater only requires a 386 processor, which this system actually manages to have, if only just barely. Now to take the software that I put on the boot disk for a quick little spin, I actually went ahead and got the camera tripod here so you don't have to watch me try to type and hold the camera steady at the same time because I'm pretty sure both of those things are not going to happen. Let's see here. Go ahead and punch up the good old QBasic with a copy of the Microsoft Gorillas game. Wasn't that a lot of fun back in the day? That showed up for the first time back in MS-DOS 5 as best I'm aware. Oh, I must have typed it wrong. It must be without an S. Yep, it's without an S. Look at that. Okay, well, no big deal. Go ahead and let the uh, computer load the program here. Which will take just a moment as it reads it in a couple hundred lines at a time. And there it is. Let's go ahead and uh, run the program here. Just have a little bit of fun with it. Ah, yes. PC speaker music. What fun. <laughs> hey, if you were paying for me to write this material, you'd have a valid point, but you're not, so... <laughs> Alright, let's go ahead and view the intro here. This is always fun. All these crude CGA-era graphics. Hmm. <laughs> 
I love that when they start thumping their chests. And then, of course, my favorite thing to do back in the day, the uh, kind of person that I am, was actually to issue a killer banana at about a 90 degree angle with very low actual velocity, followed by a self-immolating gorilla, as you can see there. And that one on the other building, he's so happy, but he doesn't realize it's going to happen to him next. <laughs> Boom! Go ahead and do it one more time here. I think I'm only playing to what, three points? It's also possible to line a banana through the sun, and if you do, the sun changes from having a smiling face to actually having a shocked expression while the banana is disappearing through the sun. So that's pretty much an example of that. It looks like the system, although it's going to need a lot of work to be restored, and I don't know when I'm going to get to all of it, it looks like the system... Well, we don't have a copy of the memory uh, status command on there. It looks like although this system will need a lot of work, that it definitely can live again, especially if I can get the power supply rebuilt. So there's not a whole lot left to say about this thing, but I'll go ahead and hit a few of the more unique features that Packard Bell included in the system hardware. Now looking here, you can see the power LED and hard drive activity printed circuit board on the front of the system case, which ordinarily would not be all that interesting, except for the fact that many computers of the time had a turbo function that could be used to increase their speed to the normal operating level for every program that happened to be well behaved, even at higher speeds. However, some programs, particularly games, had a real problem operating at higher computer speeds. They would oftentimes play way too fast. There were a couple of tricks that you could employ in software, such as reprogramming the system's interval timer to a different value to make the system run slower, but the quick and dirty thing to do was to simply lower the system's clock speed by pressing the computer's turbo button. Of course, this system doesn't actually have a turbo button, so Packard Bell implemented the mechanism to change the system speed in software. If you issue the command Control, Alt, and Number Pad minus, you'll actually drop the system to its lower speed, and you can see that the power LED just changed color to indicate that. Likewise, you can return to the high speed again by issuing a Control, Alt, and Number Pad plus, at which point the LED turns green again. I believe the low speed on these systems is 12 megahertz, and the high speed is 16, which is the natural rated speed of the microprocessor. So that's one particularly interesting feature they included. The other particularly interesting feature is a little less obvious than the clock speed. You can see that I'm sitting at a command line here. If I wanted to get into system setup, on most computers of the time, I would have had to have rebooted the computer, but not here. If I hit Control alt s I will be immediately taken into the Phoenix setup utility. However, there are limitations. If you are in the protected mode, i.e. running Windows or other software that takes advantage of the protected mode, you can't break into setup this way. You have to be sitting out at the DOS prompt in real mode for this to work. But what you can do is you can actually go through here and change system settings. Now, if you were to actually save those settings by taking the F4 option shown in the menu there, you would have to reboot the computer. But if you decide not to save your settings, or if you were just checking something, you can press the F6 key and you'll be thrown back out to the uh, work that you were doing at the DOS prompt. I wouldn't recommend doing this, even though it is possible, when you're within a software program that contains work you haven't saved and cared about, because this transition mechanism makes a lot of assumptions about things, and some of those assumptions may prove not to be so correct and might result in the computer hanging up or otherwise failing to work and your work to be lost. Well, that's about everything there is to this particular demonstration. I don't know when I'll get around to fully restoring this PC, or if I'll get around to it, because heaven knows there are a lot of projects around here that demand my continued attention. But it does prove, at least as far as the motherboard is concerned, that there is hope for this computer. So thank you for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.